Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Warner. I'm the founder of Mixergy, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they built their businesses. I was invited to uh, do an interview on stage of podcast movement. Um, and soon after I got off the stage, this guy who looks like a rock star came over and talked to me. That's like the boots, the hat, the, the whole freaking look. Um, and as someone who's tried to get a look for years and didn't make it work, I was impressed. And we sat down, we just talked to his two podcasters. He's a guy who has a podcast called uh, Business War Store, Small Business War Stories, excuse me. We talked about it. And as we were talking, he started telling me a little bit about like anxiety in business and um, you know the, the mental health challenges that we have to deal with as entrepreneurs. And I said, this does not sound like something you learn from a podcast. Tell me more about what else you're doing. And he says, Oh, I, I run a company called Proven and he starts telling me about Proven and how it's hiring software for small businesses. And I thought, all right, the world needs another piece of software to like hire. I thought this was a, pro a solved problem. And he's telling me how much revenue he's doing and how he's growing the business and what he's doing to grow the business. And I'm like asking him all these kinds of questions that I really would ask in an interview because I want to know how he got where he got. And then I said, wait, hang on. You know what? Pablo, let's just do this as an interview. And so that's what we're doing right here. Pablo Fuentes is the founder of Proven. We're going to find out how he came up with this idea. I did a little bit of research in, in uh, preparation for this interview. Apparently, it's not that he came up with this idea. It's that he came up with a bunch of really bad ideas that were close to this idea. They all seem to fail. He learned from some of them. Uh, one of them specifically he did not learn from, but now it's working. He's grooving. It actually is leading to a happy life of a guy who looks like a rock star. And so I invited him here to talk about how he did it, and we're going to find out about Pablo Fuentes and the story behind Proven, thanks to two great sponsors. The first is HostGator, hosting done right for your website, uh, website hosting done right. The second will help you close more sales. It is called Pipe Drive. I'm going to tell you about both those sponsors later. First, Pablo, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Dude, is it like the dorkiest question for me to ask you? Did it take you a long time to work on your look? Because it's not coming across right now in the in the video. You're just kind of hanging out, right? You don't have the hat. You do have some uh, guitars behind you. But let's be open. Did you have to go through some iterations to get this rock star look that I saw with the boots <laughs> and the whole thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I yeah, I think if you were to look at a picture of me uh, ten years ago, you would certainly say that yes, it took some iterations. But Describe I, I, what did what did you look like ten years ago? Oh, uh, oh, let's just say the hair uh, water fell down from the top of the head to the bottom. So I had more hair at the top and uh, had a little bit preppier look. And I don't know. I, it's just been over time, uh, I guess, but as I've gotten more into music and more into martial arts, this is kind of the way things have gone. So and more I, of an acceptance I, I, of yourself. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, let, let your freak fly fly to quote Jimi Hendrix, you know, just kind of be like, you know, just be who you are and, and it's chill. It's cool. But you know what, Pablo? Look at me. I'm like being myself too. This is just the V-neck t-shirt that people have seen a billion times over here. This is like letting your, your nothing fly, but this is who I am. I'd like to say there's a, there's a rock star in me. I just want the look of it and I can't pull well, it off. I even hire Cyrus. Let's let's play some music the next time we we get to hang out. And I, I'm coming out with an EP. I, I record, I play, and record uh, blues music. So I uh, I'm kind of uh, coming up with my first record in January. Uh, so yeah, the next time we hang out, we'll uh, we'll jam. You're not too far from me, are you? You're in San I'm Francisco. In, I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay, I thought I saw a San Francisco number. Uh, all right, you know what? I don't think music will help. The only thing that there there are two things that helped in combination for me. One is. Uh, hired a stylist who was good at finding things that were off the beaten track and that she forced me to wear at least to try. And number yeah. two, she would get me to drink alcohol before we would go out. So drinking yeah. to chill me out and get to try new stuff with her taste worked really well. This was in well, LA. I don't, I don't wear pretty much anything that comes from a store, like a regular store. Everything I buy is at vintage stores. And, uh, the only thing that I buy as new is shoes sometimes, but, uh, yeah, everything else you've seen comes from. I, I I love the hunt for like cool stuff and funky shirts and. I see. Stuff like that. So. All right, that's something that I won't ever have the patience for. I will like start listening to a podcast as I go inside, and then I get lost in the podcast <laughs> and not want to try on clothes because who knows who wore it before, and then what happens if it has cooties and we get all right. 
All right, we're going off track here. Let's talk about revenue. I saw you felt uncomfortable when I said I'm going to push you just to give me the revenue numbers in the interview. So I'm not going to push you too hard. I don't want to ruin things right off the bat here. But you got to give me the revenue to give me a sense of the revenue. Where are you guys now? Yeah, we're we're single digit millions. Uh, we're seven figure revenue company. We're growing. We're fully remote. So we we used to have an office in San Francisco for about six years. We went fully remote in May of last year. So it's been uh, what year and a half now. Okay. And uh, now, yeah, we're profitable. We're growing. Uh, we don't have any salespeople. So 100% of our customers come from content marketing. So we do, uh, we've grown and we decided to make that move about two years ago. And we went in two years from 50 monthly visitors to our blog. So about 50,000 monthly visitors. And that's what it is. It's largely content marketing that's leading to all these sales. Yeah. Yeah. It's 100%, 100% and referrals. Yeah. All right. Again, I want to know how you got here, but... But here, why does the world even, to understand what here is, why does the world need another piece of software for hiring that existed? What is it that's different about you guys? Yeah, um, so, and it still exists. We have a lot of competitors. The, the, the thing that's really unique about Proven is that we're designed exclusively for small businesses. Uh, so businesses with under 100 employees. And we have a very simple, very easy to use mobile interface, a very simple, easy to use uh, desktop interface. And oftentimes, a lot of uh, hiring products, what they do is because it's very expensive to sell to small businesses. So you can't really uh, nobody has been successfully able that I know to pay a sales force to sell a product that's this inexpensive. So you have to invest in the long run and doing and the, you know. I think we just lost your connection. Yeah, I, I lo- Sorry, you have to you're saying it's too expensive for a company to to market to small businesses. Yeah, it's too expensive for a company to buy, you know, for companies to sell to small businesses with salespeople because the product's too inexpensive. So what we do is we focus exclusively on that smaller business and the longer tail of, of customers versus a lot of our competitors that end up having to go upstream to make their business model work with salespeople. Uh, and I was just thought a, a competitor that will remain unnamed that's raised quite a bit of funding. I just got off the phone a little bit earlier. Uh, with him and yeah, they used to be a direct competitor and now they're more more of a mid market and they have more a full feature, full set of features and things like that. So they're really simple, easy to use system for small businesses to hire. That's that's what we do. Okay, and if I go to proven.com, cool domain shows that you guys raise money. Go to proven.com. I get to post my job to what 100 plus job boards, and that's the whole idea. And also, you guys will do will help me manage all the responses that come in. Yep, we'll help you manage all the responses. We have a ton of really good content about how to write your jobs, and that also as part of that content, as you mentioned, I have a podcast called Small Business War Stories. It's one thing to say you care about small businesses; it's another one to do. I just got back three days ago from a 4,000 mile trip around the country, interviewing small business firsthand to understand their problems, understand their life, and, and, and highlight their stories. You know what? I always hated the term small business. You're basically telling somebody they're small. Going back to the whole idea with the stylist, I remember the first stylist I ever went shopping with, she would never say give him a size smaller. She would say the next size down. To call a man or something that a man is going to get small is an insult. To call a business owner who spends all their time on stuff small and lead with that, I always hated that term. I wish that there was a better term yeah. for it. It's it's funny you say that. When we started the podcast, we thought about the same thing, and we were wondering should we not call it that. But in talking to people, people have a pride about mm-hmm. about that, about the small, about the term small business. It it it, it, it you know it embodies like a grit and a certain spirit. Uh, I'm writing smallness a book. doesn't embody the grit. Yeah, I don't know. It's something about. I mean, it, I I don't think people. Let's just say that I don't think people take offense to it. And uh, I'm writing a book, actually, with all the stories because I've done uh, 70 or 80 interviews now across the country with small business owners in person. I don't do remote interviews. And uh, I'm, I'm coming out with a book where I'm highlighting a lot of these you know, triumphs that people uh, have in, in, with their businesses. I think you should reconsider the name small in the title. You're going to put the you're going to call it small business war stories. It makes sense. That's a podcast. That's the message. But yeah. All right. And. I'm starting off with an insult. Uh, <laughs> and and you were doing these interviews. Uh, weren't you on an RV as you were driving through the country? Is that what it was? Or a van? No, I'm, a, I'm in a truck with my dog and my guitar. And then I stay at different, either friends or uh, Airbnb spots. Or, See, you know, this is the thing that gets me, dude. 
you raise millions of dollars, you get to travel and you have not a care in the world. I raise zero dollars. I show freaking up every day at this office. I mean, I was here today at 8.45 a.m. because I had a phone call at nine o'clock. And am I sweating things? Hell yeah, I'm sweating like, will this interview, since we started two minutes late and two minutes late, which then means that the next interview with the founder of Sensei is gonna be, look at your eyes as I do this. And then I have a team meeting and then this and that, right? This is like, this is the thing that gets me. All right, I want to understand how you get to this, to this point too, but why don't we get to know you? You're a guy, sure. just tell the story in chronological order. Guy was born in Chile. Am I pronouncing it right? Chile? Yep, Chile, yep. yeah. Um, what was it like to grow up in Chile? Uh, it was, it was good. It was different. Uh, I, I, I started coming to the U.S. when I was about 12. My dad, uh, worked in New York for the United Nations. So I started coming back and forth. And then when I was 16, I moved, uh, permanently. I also travel quite a bit. I lived in Germany as a kid. Um, so I, my, my whole life has been change and challenge. Uh, okay. So I kind of got, got used to it from an early age. But you did and, have a car wash uh, some at some point when you were in Chile. Yeah. When I was a kid, I was at a car wash. And uh, that was a uh, – yeah, I, I, I had a membership-based <laughs> car wash where I would tell people that they could pay and get a discount if they bought four ahead of time. Smart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that only lasted about six months or so. I had a partner who had all the supplies and all the stuff, and uh, it, it, the partner ended up falling through. But hey, it was, you know, it's a good experience to go and get rejected a lot by that telling people you wash their cars is, uh, you know, a good experience. And culturally, you told our producer, look, I don't come from a country or a part of the world where failure is trumpeted and, and people are excited about it. So talk a little bit about what that was like and how yeah. you had to overcome failure. Yeah, I think it's ch I think that's changing. Uh, I think more and more uh, the culture of you know failure is okay is is uh, permeating more of the world's uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, back then, uh, you know, when I started when I moved here in the mid '90s, certainly there's uh, people when they fail, they're seen as a failure, not as, as somebody who has tried something that didn't work. Um, I think that's like I said, it's changing, but definitely. Wow, I can see why he does all um, his interviews. Sorry, I can see why you do all your interviews in person. You stalled out for a second. You can, you were oh. saying that you can see why that was what. Um, well, I was not sure I that about. being a, that you had to overcome being a failure or oh, worrying yeah, about failure, not overcome yeah. being a failure. You had to overcome the fear of failure. Selling this car wash subscription helped you do that partially. You still, though, went down the conservative track. Yes, you did really well with it. You went to UCLA, very impressive uh, college. Then you went to Stanford Business School, really impressive um, uh, place to get your MBA. And as you were going through uh, business school, the OA financial crisis hit. Everyone was talking about it. And what was your feeling about it? I, I just realized that uh, when I got to Stanford, I, I had worked really hard to build a background in finance after college. I passed a couple of levels of this crazy test called CFA, and I worked at a, at a successful hedge fund. And when I got to Stanford, I was like, I don't care as much as these other people do about this. These other people are very passionate about finance, and for me, that wasn't it. And I could either continue that, that down that line and make a bunch of money, but live a, a life that didn't have a meaning to me or try to find what it was that was my calling. And, uh, you know, I'm still still digging, still finding. But, uh, you know, I would say I'm closer to it now than I was then. But back then you said, I know that going and getting a job at a hedge fund, which is what you had before school and living that life is not me. You then had to find out what was you. You yeah. and some friends from school said, let's start a company. It was a couple of friends. Uh, originally one who later left the company. I actually interviewed him on my podcast about what it was like to break up with me as a co-founder. Uh, but then we added uh, shortly thereafter another co-founder who is still my partner, Sean Falconer. So right. we, there's two of us. Okay, and it's two co-founders right now. You looked around and you saw what I see here. I go running through some really expensive neighborhoods sometimes, but a lot of bad neighborhoods in San Francisco. And the weird thing is still on the corners, you see dudes, always dudes, standing, kind of chatting, backpacks on, waiting for somebody to pick them up and give them a job for the day. You saw that. You said, this is an inefficient system. I could do better. Am I right? 
That's for exactly right. Yeah, originally this is in 2009 before really uh, apps and smartphones were prevalent and it was a text-based message system for people to get jobs. And for us, I mean, that that I could find meaning that in helping people get jobs and helping people hire. That's something that to me gave me a lot, a lot of inspiration and, uh, and, and fire, fire to. Uh, did to you work. ever talk to them before you started it or did you just oh, say yeah. You did. You would go on the corners and you talk to them right. because you speak Spanish, they speak Spanish, yep. different kind of Spanish, but still the same language. Yep. Yep. And they would tell Absolutely. you what, what kind of, what kind of understanding did you get from talking to them? Uh, a, lot, a lot of frustration, a lot of, uh, basically, uh, you know, these are very hardworking people. Um, and, uh, and the, the, as the system evolved, we, I've always gotten out and, you know, out in the field and, and, and spoken to people. I think that's the only way to truly develop a good product is to understand your, your user. But yeah, I mean, generally speaking, like a lot of inefficiency, a lot of frustration with the systems that existed to get jobs. But they don't express it as inefficiency. They're standing there on the corner. You come over to talk to them. They probably think, who is this guy? Is he going to give me a job or is he going to waste my time? You literally, yep. you were a Stanford student. You did this, right? So yep. what did what did you ask them and what did you learn from those conversations? I mean, it's all about approach, right? So I think I think it's uh, you know obviously the the way you approach them. You don't come up with a clipboard, you know, and dressed in Brooks Brothers shirts, tucked into chinos, and and go and come up. You know, you're so what did you do? And, I just came up with them in, in jeans and, and uh, she said, hey, and, you know, in Spanish, you like open up with like, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm working on the system. Uh, I, you know, can you chat for a couple of minutes? I'd love to understand how you get jobs today. And of course, like like everything in life, not everybody's going to say yes. Uh, some people, some people definitely told us no. Yeah. But uh, it also helped my original business partner, Joe Mellon, was at the design school at Stanford. And he was doing a project that had to do with day labor centers with creating systems for day labor centers to place people. Uh, so we had a built in uh, kind of like first layer or first batch of people who were uh, default. Yes. To talk to us. So that, that helped a little bit. Okay. Too. So you talk to them now, they are one side of this two sided marketplace. The other side is the people who are hiring. I always imagine the people who are hiring wouldn't want to use anything online because they want to just pay cash. They want the whole thing to be instant gratification, no sure. record. Am I right? Did you talk to them? And if you did, what did you learn? Yeah, I mean, so let, let's be clear. This this business didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let, let's be super clear. So about I'm, that. I'm trying to get like, is is why it didn't work? Be, does it go back to the foundation where you didn't do that much research, or you did research and you misinterpreted oh, no. it, or what? No, we did research. I mean, obviously, when you start a company, you you take. Uh, I mean, every idea that we ever tried. You know, you mentioned there's an article in Business. Mm -hmm. One sec. Let's wait for the video to catch up. Um, so we were saying before we disconnected um, that I asked about the people who you talked to. Did you talk to the other side of the marketplace? I know the things didn't work out, but I want to understand. Yeah, we definitely did. I think I think uh, for for me, we, we spoke to people and people told us that yes, they would use the system, they would want to hire, but that's that's what I call the free the free beer problem, right? So people, you tell them about this magical solution in their head, they're like, yeah, I'll use that, versus actually building something. Whenever I talk to entrepreneurs, I'm like, you build something and then you go out and actually get people to use it because people telling you they're going to do something is not the same as they them actually doing it. So, so they did tell you, know, you I would use it, but it. Oh yeah. They said. Okay. And the way that you wanted to do it was you said, look, these guys on the corner do not have laptops in their backpacks. They're not sitting at desktop computers when they get home, but they do have phones in their pockets. It may not be the new iPhone X, which Apple would like me to call the iPhone 10, but it is some phone in their pocket. That's how I'm going to reach them. And you're going to do it all via text messages because that's the universal uh, communication channel that was available back then on phones. Yeah. Okay. The company is called Tick or was called TickTasks.com. I have a screenshot of what it looked like. For nine ninety nine, oh, no. anyone could schedule a job. And wow. it said <laughs> at the top, it said the evolution of parking lot labor market. Yep. That's the goal. I'm the glad you're digging. I'm glad you're digging this up. I didn't know you were gonna do that. That's cool. <laughs> it's like it's like a vintage website. Yeah, it's such a, so vintage is like flash in the center of the website. One thing that you learned from that, I forget where I saw it, was you learned that people are going to respond to text messages in unpredictable ways. Am I right? That yeah, you that's thought, one of the talk things about outside that. case. 
So outside case, like people, even if you give gave people instructions or you know guidelines on how to use text messages, a lot of people, especially people whose English was their second language, and we did do it in Spanish too, would would come up with like they would conversationally respond to things. And maybe maybe ten years from now we'll have bots. I'll be able to interpret all that. But certainly, you know, nine years ago that wasn't the case. So we spent a lot of time interpreting, a lot more time than we thought interpreting outside use cases of uh, of responses. So. I see. And you couldn't use the press one if you want this job, press two if you don't, press three if you want the next job. You did that. <laughs> oh, we would, oh, we would do that. And people would respond, I want the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see then how tisk tick tasks was uh, hampered by the technology of the day. What about the, the other side of the marketplace? Were you able to get people to hit that button and schedule a job for nine ninety nine? Yeah, I think I think we did. Uh, we would we would have people schedule jobs uh, and and pay the fee. But then a lot of people would then, if they liked the person that they worked with, uh, there was a, not a lot of incentive for them to come back through us. They would just get the guy's phone number and then do it. Another thing we underestimated is how one off the use cases for these things are. Mm -hmm. So like, hey, you need to build a fence. You probably have to do that once and like clean your leaves like once a year. So there's not a lot of repeat business. Um, I see. So the people who are doing this, I always assume they were contractors, but it's not. It's some guy who needs quick work done in his backyard. He goes to Home Depot, realizes he can't do it himself, gets one of the guys from Home Depot to come in his car with him, takes him home. Yeah. The guy does the work. That's so like sketchy. Are people really willing to do that? Yeah, yeah. But I again, this is this that's a business model that lasted about six months before we went into like more of a staffing related, you know, business, and that's very very far removed from what we do today. So, and this is in two thousand nine. Just uh, want to make that two thousand nine. About a year after the iPhone came out, you guys come out with this, and I could see how it was a little bit of ahead of its time. Also, you learned a lot from it. One of the things that you learned was, hey, don't expect people to just text back with exactly what you want them to. They're going to write their own thing. We're ahead of our time. You then went back to the drawing board. You came up with a different business. Um, same same basic philosophy. You still want to be in the job market. We're going to come back to what you did there the winter of 2010. But first, I've got to tell everyone about a company called HostGator. Have you ever hosted a business, by the way, uh, using HostGator, Pablo? I have not. You have not. You're one of the few interviewees that I've had on who have not. HostGator is incredibly inexpensive and scales up with your business, which is why a lot of people who I interviewed said my first website was on HostGator. My current website is on HostGator. I have a package that includes multiple HostGator domains. It just is one of those things. You need a website, boom, you go to HostGator. For less than 10 bucks a month, you end up with a solid hosting package. As you grow, you can call them up and scale up. In fact, they don't list this publicly because I think they're like aiming for the, the starters. But yeah, you can get what I see here on this special URL I'm going to give everyone. You could get it for $3.48 a month. But if you decide, I want managed WordPress hosting where they make sure that all the plugins are right, that I'm not going to get a virus and so on, they have that. They just don't put that on their site. If you decide you want a dedicated server, they have that. They just don't put it on the site. They want anyone who's a beginner to start off with them and then they want to keep winning your business as you continue to grow. If you're out there and you're looking for a hosting company, I urge you to go check out hostgator.com slash Mixergy. I told you about the $3.48 a month plan that's on there. Don't take that. I think what you should do is, believe me, I don't get paid anymore whether you do or you don't. I think what you should do is go the next level up to the baby plan at least because that's going to give you unlimited domains. Hello, here's the beauty of unlimited domains. You have an idea in the middle of the night. You just go buy the freaking domain and then you put up a website on the same hosting package with HostGator and the whole website is up. All you have to do is install WordPress on it. You have an idea for a shop. You just go buy a domain for it and boom. Or you have one domain like I did with Mixergy, which did one thing. It did events. I had an idea. I'd like to actually do some interviews. So you go in and you uh, get ho uh, blog.mixergy.com, all part of your package, and you install WordPress on it. One click install, you're good to go. Every idea that's in your head gets the website, an outlet, a place for you to see if anyone's interested in it, and frankly, to see if you're interested in it. If you want to get started, Go to this URL, hostgator.com slash Mixergy. You're going to get unmetered disk space, unmetered bandwidth, unlimited email addresses, 
24-7-365 tech support. I'm finding out, frankly, I'm going to be honest with everyone, their tech support used to be super fast. Within two minutes, I could get a response. Now it takes a little bit longer, but they still have tech support, which hosting companies often do not do by phone. They just do by email. They do it by phone and they do it online. And if you find that I'm full of it and you're not happy with them, they have a 45-day money-back guarantee. Go check them out at this special URL, hostgator.com slash Mixergy. And don't forget to scroll to the bottom where you can see the $100 ad offer from Google AdWords. I'm telling you, they're setting you up for success. Go check them out at hostgator.com slash Mixergy. We use them when uh, I started my new bot business, but that's a story for another ad. <laughs> All right. That's you awesome. then move on to something called Worker Express. What was Worker Express? Yeah, Worker Express was basically we saw because, I, you know, we were talking about how private users had, didn't have that frequency of usage. So Worker Express was a uh, online staffing agency. The staffing market is a huge market uh, worldwide. I think 300 billion is a number gets thrown out a lot. Uh, and it's still uh, at that point was uh, it, it's becoming more modern, but still it's it's kind of a uh, it looks like a very disruptable market on paper. And uh, we started supplying temporary staffing for the construction industry. And uh, that, uh, I mean, a lot of companies have tried that. I get, I, be, I tried so many business models about, you know, once or twice a month, I get a, a new request from a new entrepreneur. It's like, hey, I know you tried this. Can you chat? I always say yes. And uh, it, it's a, it looks, it's a very attractive market on paper, the, the staffing market. Um, and we, especially blue collar staffing, we wanted to help uh provide temporary construction crews for contractors and things like that. And that, uh, because you said, look, these guys who just need somebody to paint their, their, uh, fence, their one offs. It's hard to build a business on them. Said, look, these guys who just need somebody to paint their, their, uh, fence, their one offs. It's hard to build a business on them. There's no repeat business. We get them in, they pay nine ninety nine, but then they're gone. And so how much money can we spend to recruit someone who's going to just give us nine ninety nine in, in revenue? You said, ah, oh, these contractors, they could pay, they could give us a lot of revenue over time. And right. they are a good market. You've said on your site here that they are, um, very, very relationship oriented. What else? I mean, they're very, yeah, relation. You mean as to why it didn't work? Or yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the costs. So on, on paper, the idea is like, okay, we build a staffing system. You don't need physical offices. There's comp, there's very, there are very large companies that have physical offices where people go there and you, you can do a virtual system where you don't need that. Uh, for us, what we found is that the cost, as we scaled up revenue, the, the costs never, like basically, we were never able to leverage those costs. We always, always had an inc a measured increase in costs. So over a very long period of time, I mean, there's a company called Labor Ready based out of the Northwest, out of uh, Tacoma, that has been able to, over a very long time, build a publicly traded company with this, but it didn't have technology type margins or technology type dynamics. Uh, which is what we were seeking to do, <clears throat> which is why we stepped away from that business. And many other folks have since tried to also start different types of staffing companies. And um, they, I think they've found similar things. And they have – some of them have successful businesses, but they have staffing margins, not technology margins. The big kind of dream is put taking the staffing industry and putting technology margins on it, and that hasn't been done yet. I see, and that's what you were trying to do. Um Pablo, I'm trying to find some understanding in all these different setbacks. The thing that comes to me is I'm looking again, I'm looking now at Worker Express. You're, you're kind of cute. You say contractors can search for workers. They could add workers to their quote crew on the site. They could press one button and call someone on their crew. The thing that I, I, I wonder is, did you even understand the market? I feel like you didn't fully understand the business when you got in that if I'm going to be and try to analyze this and see what's my big takeaway from the story we're telling here over the course of an hour is I feel like Pablo started with a market that just needed some technology, but not a full understanding of it, that you weren't living and breathing the people in the space. But disagree with me if that's not the thing I should be taking away. No, I think I think that's fair. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, we certainly had a lot of enthusiasm. I worked very hard on it. Uh, 
in some ways, in hindsight, it was a little bit of a problem looking, I mean, a solution looking for a problem in the sense that you, you know, we kind of had like preconceived notions and the whiteboard that, you know, the, I, the whiteboard doesn't talk back, right? You can write whatever you want on the whiteboard right. and, and, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we we definitely spent a lot of time with our customers, but yeah, it, it didn't work. I think a lot every every business model iteration we tried was a reasonable idea to try, and we worked really hard at it, and we were not able to make it work. And we're not alone. I mean, if you look at the history of funding for businesses like that, there's like hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone to that kind, that type of business in the last ten years. But today, you are living. You could definitely be doing what I'm doing right now. Do it via r- remote interviews with your interviewees publish it on your site you can do what john lee dumas does he he could record eight interviews in a day you could record eight interviews with these small entre- small business entrepreneurs in a day you want to live and breathe the same literally the same air as they do as you're talking to them and interviewing them you are in their world you understand how they feel about small business as a title enough that when i push back on you you can say no they accept it even if they don't put it on their t-shirt so I get that, and I could see it in your eyes when you're back off, Andrew, with those eyes when I was asking. <laughs> I don't see it when I look at Worker Express circa 20, uh, 2010, where here's what you express as the reason for it. Worker Express is a startup looking to disrupt the $7 billion temporary construction labor market, and it goes on from there. It's the sense that there is a bigger market. Intellectually, it makes sense. Not I am living in this space. There's a pain that punches me every day right here. Yeah. Oh, that's that's completely fair. I think that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, I think that's painful to hear that. But I think it's true. I think it's uh, the and I I do think what we do today with helping small businesses, we do, you know, live and die by that. And we're very passionate and excited about that. And and I think uh, but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, at that point, it was my first ever venture. And uh, I had a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for it, for helping people get jobs. But no, we were not. I don't think our understanding of the market was nearly as deep as as, as our understanding of our market today is. At what point did you raise money? All, all along the way, I've raised money in very inelegant fashion in like small rounds over the years. How? Um, How did you do so well raising money when so many entrepreneurs struggle with that? I mean, I think we had it, it was a it was a market where technology had not really and still hasn't really, uh, you know, uh, made left really its mark. And we were willing to work hard on the problem and we had a solution. We had a product. We had customers that were using it. And uh, we I mean, I knocked on a lot of doors. I mean, I, I think I pitched over 250 times in my in my uh, time as an entrepreneur. So. I got a lot of people say no, but eventually uh, we got people to to believe in what we were doing and, and, and give us a shot. It was just knocking on a lot of doors. What's the, the first investor? Where did it come from? Uh, the first investor was a classmate uh, in business school. I see. All right. Is it weird going to your classmates and asking to raise money from them? Uh, it can be. I think that at Stanford, there is an ecosystem where that's kind of part of the game and people are more open to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I mean, it, it, it was tremendously helpful because he gave us, you know, some credibility. The hardest investor you'll ever get is the first one. After that, people have more social proof that other people have also done it, especially with, when somebody has never started a company before going into an, a, a, a new market. Yeah, that definitely helped quite a bit. Okay, uh, let's go to another one, and then I want to understand how you deal, dealt with all this internally. Uh, yeah. Spring 2011, magic time card. Oh, Geofence geez. check-ins for workers at construction sites. The problem yeah. there was like, – <laughs> talk about it. I, I love this. We're, we're digging really deep into stuff that I hadn't thought about in a while. And mo- most, most most times when I do interviews now, it's about proving and about small business war stories. So, But I like it. This is good. Let, let's, so go ahead. Magic time. Card. That, that was a special one. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's partially your fault. I told you, you guys have really good content on your site and you go introspective on it and you, you're thorough. So I'm not pulling this out of nowhere. It's not like my research staff just sat down and said, we're going to put together this great list. It's like, you actually wrote this great blog post about all the things that you went through to get to proven. And I highlighted it. I used, what's this tool? Do you know, uh, Digo? Digio? D-I-G-O? D-I-I-G-O? I don't even know. I, I use that to highlight. I'm really big on highlighting. 
Hang on, let me call you right back. Uh, all right, let's let's continue. Talk about how you came up with the idea for Magic Time Card. Yeah, Magic Time Card is actually a product within a product. So when we had the staffing business, we had this geofencing product when people checked into the job to make sure that people were showing up at the time that and and reduce. We're trying to figure out ways to reduce our operational costs and and not have people on the field. So we're trying to figure out how we could do that. So it was a geofencing way for people to check into a job site. And this was a this was a true true like stupid mistake, which is we're like okay, well we'll maybe like start selling that in addition to the staffing services to see if we can also do that. So pursuing more than one business model at a time that is a colossally stupid idea, and we were definitely doing that. So it's, kind of uh, as I was looking at your history, I was thinking of that thirty seven signals base camp uh, is a new name of the company, of course. Uh, post about sell your uh, oof, the the things that are the byproducts, sell your byproducts. I feel yeah. like maybe that's what you were trying to do there. Yeah, we were trying to be creative in ways where, like the staffing business, we were encountering some barriers with it, and we thought, okay, this is something that people do want, and so we started selling that as its own product um, without much success either. But. Okay. All right. I'm going to talk about my second and last sponsor and then come back and ask you now mentally, internally, how are you dealing with all this stuff? Because frankly, I have one little setback or one thing sucks and I feel like everything sucks because I get angry. We did this uh, sales challenge. We bought a bunch of ads. The ads went to a landing page. I go, who the who the hell on the team created this ugly landing page with too much text? A landing page is supposed to be a box and a little bit of text. You're adding so much text to the landing page. People are going to have this uh, sense of indecision. I have to read all this. Maybe I'll say it later. Maybe I don't want it. And then we lose them. But you don't – I don't know. I wonder how you dealt with it. All right. Here's the software that I got to tell everyone about. It's I've been evangelizing this long before they were sponsors. It's called PipeDrive. <clears throat> here's the nice thing about PipeDrive. It forces everyone on the team – to use a specific sales process. What's the first step you take when somebody, when you're interested in selling to someone or where they express interest in buying from you? What's the second step? What's the step after that? And then it forces you to put every one of those steps into a column. I keep saying forcing because this is going to hold you accountable. You tell it what your process is. They make sure that you actually go through this process as a team. When we started selling chatbots, I said, let's use it. We got a little lazy. We didn't use it as a team. The person who was in charge started just like winging it, making phone calls. She knew what she was doing. She's a good salesperson, but things weren't happening. She wasn't closing enough sales. And as a result, she was feeling a little disconnected. I didn't know where she was. You end up with all these problems. You start blaming each other. Maybe Andrew didn't give her enough information. Maybe she didn't give me enough. Maybe she's not doing enough sales. I have no idea. I finally got on a call with her earlier this week and I said, listen, last week actually, I said, listen, we have to actually go back to using PipeDrive. I want every step of your process in PipeDrive. So we sat down, we did a Zoom screen share, we laid out every step of our process in PipeDrive. What's the first thing you do when someone uh, expresses interest? What's the second thing and so on? And she's a good systems person, so she really took to this. Laid it out in PipeDrive, we started going through it. Earlier this week, I was curious, how is she doing? First of all, she made a sale. Second, she actually now has a clear board where I could see where every single potential sale is. If you guys are out there and you want to grow your sales, I urge you to um, go check out this special URL where you can try out the software and see how it will grow your sales. It is called pipedrive.com slash Mixergy. That's the URL. By the way, I got to tell you, what software do you use, Pablo, to keep track of the people you're you're uh, getting to do interviews with? To do interviews? Yes. Uh, I just used Excel, Excel spreadsheets. Excel right. spreadsheet. Oh, if you were to use pipe drive, you'd have so many more possibilities. Why do you use Excel? That means you have to do it all yourself, right? Do you have a team that helps uh, you? Yeah, we have a team. We have, we have a system down that's, that works pretty well that I came up with. So it's, uh, it's the, we, we only do one show per week and I do, I, I record them in these 4,000 mile tours and batches. So it's, it works for me. I do it in pipe drive. I have 10 steps to getting somebody in our process and closing them. And uh, this yeah. allows me to have way more suggestions for who we should be doing interviews with. Look, like I can see that uh, this guy, Chris, who's working, who's helping us out, just suggested the founder of uh, Coinbase. For some reason, I didn't think to have Brian Armstrong on, but Chris did. And so he suggested him pipe drive. Mm -hmm. And now someone could start researching. Very system oriented. I want to crush this freaking thing. All right. Anyone who's out there who's interested, go check them out. Pipedrive.com slash Mixergy. 
Um, I'm so convinced that I can help you get even better guests if you switch to pipe drive. You guys should have us in. You should, you know what we should do? At the end of this, I should show you my pipe drive. I'll blow you away. Okay. All right. So how's good? Did you feel any, um, insecurity? Did you feel stress as, as you went through all this? Oh yeah. Tremendous amounts. I mean, uh, like you said, I mean, it's uh, if you're honest with yourself, like, you know, facing that failure to to reach a good outcome and reach find a good business model is uh, can be painful. It's a lot of it's a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of our um, investors have told us that a lot of other companies that have invested would have given up a long time ago. Like forget getting into seven or eight business models. You know, they would have given up a long time ago. So yeah, it was definitely uh, very challenging. Most entrepreneurs I, I know have a like a day that they remember where things were really close to the end for them. What was your lowest day? Do you remember? You're nodding. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. One of yeah. Them. Uh, the day that we had to let go of 15 people. And or no, I'm sorry, we went from 15 to two people and we had just hired a couple from Canada and we thought we were going to be able to raise more money. We were not able to raise more money. The second day they showed up, we realized we had to lay off everybody. So I gave them my apartment. So I basically was like, had all my clothes in the back of my car and have a place to stay. I, I was staying with with uh, my then girlfriend and uh, I was. Uh, yeah. I was crying on my couch and I was literally uh, crying on your couch. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Owning, owning to the fact that I, you know, I'd screwed up royally and I screwed up, uh, you know, we were not, had not been able to get to the place where where we wanted to. Absolutely. When, when you're feeling bad, where does your head go? For me, it's, um, all these people who I said I knew what I was talking about are going to see that I was a failure. All these people who I borrowed money from are now not going to get paid. Or this disaster of for the next five years where I need a break, I won't be able to even have a break because I can't afford it. And what kind of job will I get because I'm an employable entrepreneur? Where, talk, talk about the dialogue <laughs> in your head. You're nodding to someone. Exactly those things. I'm unemployable. Uh, what, what, what's going to happen? Uh, what am I going to do? I mean, and to be, I mean, to be clear, I think it's important to live through those emotions. I mean, it's not like I cried with every single problem. Like, you know, in, in the last decade, that's the one time I can remember we went from 15 people to two people. I didn't have a place, you know, I didn't, I basically like gave my apartment to, to that couple. So yeah, I mean, I think, uh, for me, what, what kind of, uh, saved me was I got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and I'd never done mar martial arts in my life before. In 2011, I started training jujitsu, and and that gave me it's it's uh it gave me a presence when you're fighting somebody. It's amazing how you're unable to think about other stuff, unable to think about like your grocery list, unable to think about your work problems or anything else. You you're forced to just deal with that that you have in front of you. And to me, that provided me a very needed form of uh, of self-awareness and growth that helped me through what would be really another few years of meaningful challenges before hitting on a profitable growing business model. I'm looking at the note. You and I met August 24th, 2018. I quickly fired off an email to my assistant, told her to add you to, to pipe drive and uh, to ask you to do an interview. In my notes, it said mental health and anxiety. This seems yeah. like just a bad day. Is that all it is? And you're you're making it sound like it was bigger, or was there more to this? Well, I mean, if you've raised at that point, we'd raised two million dollars, and you go from fifteen people to two people. I would say that, and that's like you you don't you put all your life savings into that. I'd say that's and you don't have a place to stay because you gave your apartment to two former employees. That's more than just a average bad day. Um, so then how long did it last and were you in enough of a funk that you weren't actually producing? Uh, no, we, I mean, for, for a few days, uh, then we quickly just were able to rechannel that into, into, uh, figuring out a way to, to start testing business models and doing things. I think my business partner and I have both supported each other through this, uh, Sean and I, you know, Sean had a background in CrossFit. So we both have like this kind of fighting spirit where we want to like continue and try and try and go and go. Um, so yeah, we channel that into, into, you know, testing and new business models and, and, and doing, and doing more things. So the next one, um, I'm looking at your blog post is 
Uh, workers now. You said we heard from trade schools that they wanted help placing people. So we decided to jump into that. What did, what were you hearing? And the conversations that you had with them were very positive. People were verbally enthusiastic, even though, you know, there were still challenges. What were you hearing that made you think this is good? This is a next model for us to follow. Um, sorry, you cut out there. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Please? What was it that, what were you hearing as you were talking to trade schools that made you decide to jump on this? Yeah. Trade schools were talking about how it was very difficult for them to play, to place people. And, uh, they, you know, to, they didn't have a system to keep track of who went where they didn't have a way for trades, especially people who were in the trades to, um, effectively market themselves. And we thought the systems we had built could be used effectively for that. And at that point, we're grasping at like, you know, whatever we could and different ideas and try to figure out, you know, there's, you know, like Ben Horowitz says, there's always a move and we're trying to make moves. So Why didn't you just say, I'm going to go get a job? I remember Matt Mullenweg. I asked him, why, why did you start this, uh, this company automatic, the makers of WordPress? Weren't you afraid? And he said, dude, I'm a developer. I could always get a job. He would have, if things didn't work out, go out and get a job as a developer. Why didn't you say, you know what, this isn't working out. I'll give back whatever money we have. I'll go get a job and I'll start fresh. I'll play my music. I can come back to this later on. We didn't, well, we didn't have much money left. Uh, the last, we made $120,000 last about 10 months with all expenses uh, for three people in, in, in San Francisco. So uh, it was, it was uh, we didn't have any money to give back. Okay. Um so, and, and um, I'm kind of unemployable too, kind of like you were saying. I'm not somebody, you know, I I don't know. Uh, I For me, I had to keep trying. I had to keep going with everything I had. And that, that's what we, you and I talked about back at Podcast Movement and about the anxiety stuff. Because it's true that to be an entrepreneur, you have to keep trying, keep going. But it's also dangerous advice to give to people to say, like, you just got to always keep driving because I've known people and friends of friends that have also committed suicide or hurt themselves in that process. Right. So for me, I found I was aware that like I needed to have other things. And that's where Brazilian Jiu Jitsu came in and, and also seeking being open with my failures. And that's why I've written, I've written all these blog posts talking about basically how much I suck at things uh you know because it helps you process all these things and you're straightforward about like look i I mean i tried this i tried hard and it didn't work and then also finding people that you can trust that you can uh, talk to has been really important along along the way how do you find someone you can talk to about this I, I mean, I think San Francisco, you're there, you know, there's an ecosystem of people that are kind of in that. And there's kind of two paths, three. There's the ones that don't say anything that maybe like talk to only themselves or their family. There's the ones that are always crushing it, quote unquote, which come to find out almost never are. And then um, then there are people who are, you know, willing to if you are the one that takes the initiative to open up, I think people are more likely to reciprocate on that. And I was uh, I was able to find people that, that, you know, that were good sounding boards and I was a sounding board for them as well. That is a good thing, actually, that you really can be open. Um, I do wonder sometimes around here if I am super open about my challenges how many people are really supportive and they're damn good at being supportive, but then afterwards will like write me off mentally because I am not crushing it. I'm not in that. I am unstoppable. You don't, you think I'm getting my head about it. That's crap. That's, that's, that's complete bullshit. That's, that's basically, uh, that's, that's not focusing on substance. That's focusing on like flash and short term stuff. And the, in the short term, like to quote, uh, I think it's either Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger in the short term, the market is a voting machine. And the long term, it's a weighing machine. You want to be heavy. You don't want to be popular short term. Who fucking cares what people do short term? Like, it, it, like I, you ought to be true to yourself and you have to be authentic to yourself. And being on it, like, especially if you're an entrepreneur, like, listen, it sucks sometimes and it sucks many times. And being, you know, being open about it, in my experience, and sure, and to be honest with you, yeah, sure, there are people who have written me off because of that. But who cares? Do I want to be close to people who are, you know, like lack enough self-awareness to see their own dark sides and to see their own problems and like would quote unquote write me off because of that? Probably not. So it's cool. Good riddance. Here, here's the downside to it. The downside is that at some point, some of these people are going to possibly buy your business. And if they see you as this unstoppable force, they kind of want to get in on that. 
if they see you as a mush who's always going through challenges or that's what they know, I think they're, they, they want to stay away. Or do you tell me, maybe I'm getting my head about that. I don't know. I, I, I can go to sleep knowing that I'm being authentic to myself and that I'm continuing to do and work hard. I mean, you're talking about how like you look like you're cruising. I, I was up at six in the morning today and I'm working, you know, for another four or five hours. It's 5 p.m. here. So I'm not cruising. You're I'm not hard. I, I'm not. I'm working hard at what I'm doing on my craft. So when you're but, traveling, what kind of work are you doing in that period where to me, it seems like you're in that easygoing lifestyle and I wouldn't want to tell you my challenges. What are you, what are you going through? Oh, well, you're, in you're the last, in the last three weeks, I, ah, we got to call you right back. Sorry. Take it. You were for the last three yeah. weeks. Start there. So, so yeah, for the last three weeks, I drove over 4,000 miles. I, I, I recorded 31 different shows in person with amazing businesses around the country. A lot of high profile ones like Teton Gravity Research, this, you know, the ski film company, uh, you know, Mystery Ranch is like a famous maker of backpacks, all kinds of me Meow Wolf and art installation in Santa Fe, like all kinds of really interesting small businesses. And this provided like our content strategy for the next six months. And now I'm writing a book uh, that is, you know, puts us out as a thought leader in the small business space based on all these interviews I've done around the country. So if you think about driving 4,000 miles and producing 31 shows in three weeks, that's not what I would call chilling. But then who's, who's running the company? Who's trying to think of, uh, the next product? Who's trying to make sure that everyone is, uh, responding to customer requests? What's, who's, who's keeping things going as you're doing that? Well, I mean, we have systems. I have a business partner. We have systems. We have 10 people. We have 10 employees that work full time on the business. What kind of systems have, keep it going? I mean, everything is like documented in processes. And like we have, you know, specific, you're talking about customer, customer uh, support. We have specific systems built around that. Uh, you know, same thing with like our content marketing and conversion. I'm also, as I'm driving, I'm on calls with everybody, with like my team, with, uh, with my business partner. So yeah, I mean it's you have to you know remain involved and there's Wi-Fi everywhere, so you get you get somewhere and you you know pull up all your reports, pull up all your stuff. You know um, what? That's I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is something that I need to learn from you and other people. How are you systemizing your stuff? Is it like Google Docs with processes or using checklists? Because I I can see how that would make you more of an efficient team. Yeah, we I mean checklists. I live by checklists. I have an app uh, called Clear where it's very, very simple. I keep all my checklists yeah. on my phone for everything I need to do. And it's not a complex like scheduling system, yada, yada, yada. It's like literally just checklists. What about so for you, uh, for your team? Is it, is, what's like the content, let's talk content creation. You said you have a system for that. Where is that written and, and how is that organized? Yeah, so we have, twi you know, once a year we get together, actually twice a year we get together the entire team, everybody, we call it Proven Live, and we plan out, so all the content's planned out uh, for, you know, for the foreseeable future, so it's not, nothing's being, like, improvised. I mean, obviously we do improvise a lot of things because you have to adapt, but uh, we have, yeah, we do rely on Google Docs a lot, we rely on, uh, you know, uh, Google Sheets and, uh, and, you know, spreadsheets and checklists and calendars. So you, that once a year you make a list of all the different blog posts that you guys want to have uh that's more like once a quarter once uh, a quarter okay yeah so once a quarter your process is we're going to have a, a list of it does the writer then know i have to go into a spreadsheet pull out one of the topics that we picked and then has a step-by-step -step process for what to do with it uh no we have a director of marketing who coordinates like depending on which freelancer what what writer's working on it we also have a lot of guest posts so we as we've gone up in domain ranking and our traffic's you know to our blogs gone from 50 people to 50,000 people a month a lot more people have been reaching out to us or written you know writing uh, uh guest posts so that, that we have an entire process to coordinate that so but, I mean, take me through just describe one of the processes you're especially proud of like for me it's that pipe drive process for booking guests i'm so proud we have Google Docs describing it. Yeah. I have software that manages it. We have mess uh, uh, metrics that tell us how well we're doing. Is there one yeah. that you're especially proud of that you can show me as a model for what we could learn from you? I think it's just being really clear. So, for example, our, our process to publish, we publish every Wednesday morning small business war stories, right? I produce 
the actual um, sound file and I produce the actual attached uh, uh, blog post that goes with it. And then our director of marketing knows specifically to look for sp images and create all the graphic assets for that. And then uh, and my business partner um, does all the connection between HubSpot and Libsyn to make sure that everything and everybody knows we have a specific by Tuesday. I mean, it's already today's Tuesday. It's already happened for tomorrow morning and everybody knows exactly what they need to do. What software then, coordinates all that? Uh, it's Google Docs and Slack. So Google Docs says here are the steps. Everyone on Slack is talking, but they're going through the same Google Docs. Uh, everybody has their own, everybody has their own checklist and their own thing. They, everybody knows what they okay. need to do in one place. And, uh, and then we, uh, the next, the actual day of publishing, then we do a follow up email that also gets updated. That's with specifics about that episode for that guest to help them promote the episode. You know, I had this great conversation with Saeed Balki from, uh, Optin Monster and he owns a bunch of other, uh, software. I said, how are you constantly growing all this software? He's got this little software empire. He pulls out cash, profit from his business. Did I just lose you again? Oh, no. He pulls oh, out man. profit from the business and he goes and buys the real estate under gas stations. And then that gives him continuous uh, sources of revenue that don't depend on the internet and it's more passive. I said, how are you doing all this? And he told me same thing, systems. I said, what does it look like? He pulls out his phone. He created a, his own internal WordPress only, uh, his own internal only WordPress site with all the systems. He shows me step by step how each process, including for writing posts on his site goes. I feel like I learned a lot just from watching him. I, I don't know if you're into yeah. it, but at some point I want to do this with other entrepreneurs, like a screen share half hour. I show you my process. Here's how I'm running my company. Can I see yours? I'll do 15 yeah. minutes. You do 15 minutes. And I just ask questions so that I could see how so we could organize I, our better. Our team I'm, better. I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm kind of a lo-fi guy. I think simple lo-fi systems, Trump, no systems. And maybe there are people who have more elegant systems than I do, but I use paper notebooks, that app clear, a whiteboard that's behind that door. And, and literally just like having like things written down and then there's a great book that I'm actually going through right now. It's actually currently under my mic called Getting Things Done. Uh, and that's, it's a great book yeah. because it, a lot, it, it teaches you how to get things onto places where you're not constantly thinking about them. And I also meditate every day. So being able to clear your mind and have things in different places allows you to then focus on the thing that you're doing. And by the way, I don't think, I think it's, it can be overwhelming to think like, I need to have all these fancy systems for my company to work. I think incremental process and, and, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You get like, you know, build a little bit better system for this, iterate on it. And, and yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see how people do it. All right. Maybe, maybe there's some for a follow up conversation. Let's go on then. Now you've gone through all these different ideas. Da, 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 2011. You come up with Proven version 1.0. How much did it cost you to buy the domain Proven.com? I think we negotiated like 25 grand back then. That's not bad at all. And it's easy to spell. Even my bad spelling can, can figure <laughs> it out. Wow. Okay. So I see that you bought it. You had barely any money left. How did you even, why did you do it instead of, you know, get the domain getproven.com? Uh, I think at that point we still had some money left. Uh, it was, it was about six months before the debacle that I, that I described before. Okay. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, for us, it was important at that point to, to establish a brand. I think I'm happy that we have it. I think yeah. uh, it's a very powerful domain name, yeah. but the business has evolved a lot since then. And we did a, you know, a restaurant marketplace and then that evolved into the small business hiring system that we have today. First the restaurant market marketplace? It was a restaurant employment marketplace. Again, yeah. still employee based, okay? And you said we're gonna let restaurants Every, everything everything we've ever done has been how do you help people get jobs and how do you help businesses hire using mobile phones and using technology? So even though it's like a lot of different business ideas, it's not like we went from gummy bears to explosives. Yeah. It's like a different, different things, like different ways to try to find a business model in that area. Um, what happened when you were doing it just for restaurants? It worked. It worked. It started it growing. Yeah. It, it started working in San Francisco. Uh, but, uh, we wanted to expand beyond just restaurants and we started, we went uh, to small businesses nationwide. And how did you find restaurants at first in San Francisco? Just walk door to door. You walk door to door. 
Oh, yeah. You said, do you need a waiter at short term, short, uh, short basis? Uh, it wasn't short term. It was for permanent employment at that point. Yeah. But it's just like, it? you know, do you want an alternative to putting the sign up on, on your window. I got it right here. It's called proven.com. Or, or That's what you or did. Or on Craigslist. Yep. Uh, or a Craigslist. What was a Craigslist thing? No, it was, it was, it was, do you want an alternative? Like you hate Craigslist. We have a better system and we built the marketplace that way. All right. Um, and then you started to get into content marketing. Content is the number one thing for you for bringing in traffic. You're talking about it. What worked for you with content marketing? Because I see a lot of businesses can't get that right. It's like a whole other thing to promote. You have to promote the content and then promote the business and find a way to get the content you promoted to lead to sales in the business. And then they just say, yeah. why am I, why am I running two businesses here? I better yeah. focus just on my main company. What did you do right? Well, it's a distribution system. So content is the same thing as running a sales team, right? It's one, it's a distribution engine for your product. So again, it's like very, very process and data driven. Like we look at what specific pieces of content convert, uh, how often are people visiting those pieces of content, what kinds of customers are coming from them. So every single week we're analyzing that and looking at the specific numbers, specific customers, specific, you know, uh, cohorts that, that were acquired with a specific batch of content and like what happened to that. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of numbers and a lot of, lo and, and that's where I think having the training at a hedge fund has helped me because I'm very comfortable with spreadsheets and looking and analyzing data and processing large amounts of data. But I think we're all. Ooh. We lost the connection. Oh, there we go. We lost yeah, the connection yeah, again. So, you're saying yeah, you're comfortable so, with a lot of data and then I lost you. Yeah, I'm comfortable with a lot of data and we've always been, you know, in God we trust everybody else bring data. So we, <laughs> we, we, we don't assign, it's not like, oh, Johnny or, 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 or Jack had a good idea. It's like, okay, everybody brings ideas and then we measure against numbers. I'm looking at similar web to see where you get your traffic. Number one source of traffic is indeed.com. Number one is Work at home mom, work at home mom revolution, I guess is what the site is. What are they doing? We have, a very, we have a very, very long tail. I mean, the, that that is not a, neither one of those is a large percentage of our traffic. Most of our traffic uh, is, is a very long tail of referring sites. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm seeing that as, oh, I see 9.58% of traffic is coming from referrals. Of that 9.85, 30% is from Indeed. Okay, so it seemed like it was a bigger amount. You do seem yeah, to yeah, get 70 yeah. plus percent from search. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. Search is really big. The word job description seems like a big keyword for you. Let me see yeah, what happens. So we're, we're in the first page. So if you go to job board, or job boards and things like that. So. Uh, yeah. So if I do, I'm just typing in job description to see how that works. Who does your SEO? Is it you guys? Yeah, we do everything in house. For oh, okay, us, so... there's no, there's no difference between SEO and marketing. It's one thing like where that's integrated. I see it. What did you learn about SEO that's still working that maybe could work for someone in the audience? Yeah, a lot of link building stuff. So we took, I mean, none, none of this stuff. SEO and content marketing is kind of like, how do you get a beach body? You get a beach body by eat less sugar, drink lots of water, work out four or five times a week. I promise you, if you do those things, you'll have a beach body within a year. And it's the same thing with content marketing. You have to publish good content, create backlinks from the, from that content, from from like high quality, high domain ranking link creators and, and promote your content. And it's just like, it's brutally difficult to do it over and over and over and over and it's boring and stuff doesn't work and you have to, so it's not, it's not pretty, it's not sexy. And it takes a long time to actually get the results, but that's how you do it. It's super simple. We actually published all of our, my business partner, Sean Faulkner, published a very uh, popular blog post about how we grew our traffic um, on SEO that works. Uh, we took that course. So it, it's not, it's not uh, hard. It's very simple, but it's very, it's not complex, I should say. It's not complex. It's simple, but it's, it's hard to do every day. But this, is this, this uh, from backlinko.com? That's right. That's a very popular article uh, that my business partner, we outlay our entire strategy there. So anybody who wants to do it can just do it. I see. This is on Brian Dean's site. It's the SEO checklist, 48.7% uh, more organic tra traffic. Here's the case study. And it's yeah. on uh, we've Backlinko. We've continued to grow our traffic significantly since I got published. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, you know, you have systems-based, you know, look at the numbers and it's a long, long game. 
you, it's going to suck for a long time. And then the good thing about it is that once you start getting more more traffic, it's much more defensible and you don't have to pay a team of salespeople every month to to be your SEO engine. What's the but course yeah, that you took that taught you how to do this? It's Brian Dean's course, SEO That Works. Uh, all right. Yeah, I think the world of Brian, I don't know him super well, but I've uh, just keep I, I work with uh, I work with people who work with him, and I've worked with him a little bit. I think he was on Mixergy a couple of times. Um, yeah. Smart guy. My business partner is a lot closer to him than I am, but yeah, we we deeply respect and appreciate what he's taught us. He's good. He's just not a loud mouth, so you don't get to hear much about him, which is what I respect about him, but also what keeps him from like being someone that everyone who's listening can say, "Oh yeah, I know Brian." Yeah, but he's, I don't know, man. Those, it's the second time you've said something like that. Like, it's the long game. It's a market's a weighing machine. You know, that guy does I'm that. I'm not putting him five. down. I'm just saying he's not a loudmouth. Yeah. I actually think so. Look, let's yeah. take a look, by the way, on the well, site. But, but hold on. But it's the second time that we've talked, something's come up when you're in where yes. you said, like, you know, they're kind of valuing the flash over the substance. Like, you know, it's, it's about laying down things like year after year after year and doing them over and over that that's where people succeed in the long run. All right. Good place I to leave it. it. Anyone love, who wants to go you, check man. out your site, well, ta-da, the domain is easy. It's just proven.com. Um, and I want to thank my two sponsors. I like that we got into these arguments, but I, I would have liked more um, – I, like I don't think we've argued about things that that I disagree with you on. I think I'm I'm provo- I'm being provocative to get your point of view. Sounds good, man. I, I you know you know I got nothing but love for you, and I deeply respect what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's it's always good to uh, you know talk to somebody uh, who can level with you and uh, dig deep into your past failures. So thank you. <laughs> are you profitable now? Yeah, you are. And your yeah. your investors are okay with you being profitable and staying where you are. They don't want uh, you to take well, on these I, major sites. Ah, uh, there, the so connection could, dropped again. Like, What's going on? You guys have some kind of bad yeah. weather in in, uh, in Austin. That's why this. Is yeah, happening. there's 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 a storm in Austin right now. Okay, uh, are your investors pushing you to get more growth at the expense of profits? Uh, no, I think our investors, you know, want us to succeed and have a good outcome. I think uh, at, the, at this point, this is the level, you know, we're growing uh, double digit percentage every year and uh, we're happy with that and want to continue to do what we're doing. All right. The two sponsors that I mentioned, the first is a company called Pipe Drive. It will help you close more sales. Go check them out at pipedrive.com slash Mixergy. And the second is a-